Hey guys, as promised, here's a little video about a well about how a mass spectrometer works. Uh, the video, however, is going to be divided into, if you like, two parts. First is how the velocity selector part of your mass spec works, and the second is going to be sort of how the whole thing works when put together. Okay, so the image that you see up here. Uh, is of a velocity selector. And as you can see, we've got a positively charged plate up here, negatively charged plate down here, so more or less a capacitor. Uh, and when those plates are charged, it's going to produce an electric field. So here's the electric field, right? It goes from plus to minus. Meanwhile, all these X's that you're seeing here, right, those are showing that there's also a magnetic field inside of your velocity selector. This is important because you need both of those fields in order to, well, in order for the velocity selector to do its job. As the name implies, it's only allowing particular velocities of charged particles to make it through. So if you had some charge come flying in here, right, uh, and it, you know, it's coming in like that, it's not going to make it through anyway because it's going to crash you know into one plate or the other okay on the other hand if you had some come in straight but they're going too fast or too slow they won't make it through all right now this is shown by taking these two equations here the magnetic force is that qvb bit and the electric force is qe and if those two forces act in opposite directions, which we'll talk about why they do in a minute, uh, but if they act in opposite directions, then that means that you would have, uh, in the case where you have equilibrium, QVB equals QE. All right, so if it's going at that very particular speed where the magnetic force equals the electric force, then it'll make it through, and that very particular speed actually only is going to depend upon the magnitudes of those two fields. Because as you saw, the charge actually canceled out, which is kind of cool, right? The fact that a proton and an electron could both make it through, or a proton and an alpha particle, say, could both make it through. If you don't know what an alpha particle is, it's a helium nucleus, it's got a plus two charge as opposed to just a proton, which would be a plus one charge. Anyway, Q cancels, right? All right, now, as far as the reason why the forces are in opposite direction, it's going to be up to you to do the right-hand rule stuff because I can't do, do that on this app. I'm sorry, maybe I could make a video of myself doing the right-hand rule, but I think that would still be maybe just goofy or something. So let's talk about how this goes. If that's a positive charge... The direction that the electric field would push a positive charge would be in the direction of the field lines. So therefore, if it's a positive charge, the electric force would be as shown here, right? It would be downwards, okay? All right, now we have to do our right-hand rule. Remember, point your plane of your hand in the direction of V. Okay, so heading to the right. It says the magnetic field is into the page, right? Remember, we're looking at the back end of the arrow, the fletchings. So you'll curl your fingers into the page or the screen or whatever we're talking about. And your thumb is therefore pointing up, up the screen, if you like. Okay, so therefore, again, in the direction shown here, right, opposite the direction of the electric force. If it were a negative charge instead, those directions would be exactly reversed, right? Negative charges move opposite the direction of the electric field. And ditto for how you apply your right-hand rule, right? If a positive charge would get pushed up, then a negative charge would get pushed down. So actually, the sign of the charge is unimportant. The magnitude of the charge is also unimportant. All that actually matters for making it through a velocity selector is the velocity. Now you'll have to somewhat excuse the blurriness of the image here, but this is showing how the two parts of a mass spectrometer are going to fit together. In a mass spectrometer, uh, you have a velocity selector uh, 
so right here, that whole thing, which we already talked about, uh, preceding some region here where there's only a magnetic field, right? And based on the spacing of the X's and stuff in your picture, you can see, okay, look, spacing, spacing, spacing. Same spacing in this other region, or excuse me, that's not true. Well, they went and changed the magnetic field. They weren't supposed to. Usually the way it's going to go is you'll have the same magnetic field in both the detector region, so that's in here, and in your velocity selector region. Although I suppose there's no reason why they couldn't be different. Um, as long as you know what the magnetic field is in your detector region, you can do all the things that I'm about to talk about. Okay, so your velocity selector first, because you have to know the velocities of the things coming in in order to actually do any of the calculations that allow you to do what a mass spectrometer does. Okay, now first I guess we should say what does it do? A mass spectrometer is for determining the mass of charged particles that are coming into it. All right, now the reason why that works out the way it does is, remember the magnetic force that would act on those particles as they come in would be Q, V, B. There's your magnetic force. And also recall that if they're, you know, individual charges flying around and they hit your magnetic field, since the force applied by the magnetic field is always going to be um, perpendicular to V and perpendicular to B. It's going to be inwards like that, okay, always perpendicular to both. And so the result is going to be that it forms a, in this case, semicircle. That's pretty typical. It's usually going to be a semicircle. Um, okay, and find that circular motion. So that means that you can say that the magnetic force is a centripetal force. So QVB equals MV squared over R. You can see that the Vs aren't going to cancel out, right? You get, after canceling one of them, QB equals MV over R, right? So you have to know the velocity of the particles coming in in order to calculate their masses, which is what a mass spectrometer is for. The M there is often what you really want to know and the R is the part that you're going to measure, right? So you're trying to find M, you're going to measure R, okay? Because based on M, the R is going to be different. Let's solve this equation for R real quick. If I solve the equation for R, I'll have R equals MV over QB. Okay? Um, so that means that the radius that it moves through is going to be, uh, if you like, linearly proportional to the mass. It's also proportional to some other things, right? V, you know what that is, though, because it had to get through a velocity selector to get to the detector. Um, it also depends on Q, though, which can make things a little bit complicated. As it turns out, the charge-to-mass ratio is really what determines your radius. Okay, so in order to get M, you actually kind of have to already know what Q is. You have to be selecting for, say, singly charged ions or doubly charged ions. And that means maybe some other uh, charge selectors or something like that, you know, earlier on. I don't know. Mostly what you end up finding really is a charge to mass ratio. But if you knew what the charge was, you could easily find the mass. Okay, now, the other thing that you might be trying to find, we said, is mass. Okay, that's re really what you're usually trying to find because you presume you know Q. If you solve this equation for mass, you get QBR over V. All right, now, in both of these equations here, uh, oh, sorry, one more thought there. You can see that the, the mass is linear propor linearly proportional to the radius. So if one particle impacts at one centimeter from the detector, then you know that it would have half the mass of something that impacts at two centimeters along, right? Because it's linearly proportional. Um, very often, the V in this equation, you're going to substitute in the thing that we had from the velocity selector earlier, which, if you recall, was moments ago, we derived that V equals E over B. 
Okay, so often it'll actually end up looking like this. ME over QB squared. Okay, and then it's not in terms of V anymore. All right, you could make a similar substitution for finding M. All right, finally, in the homework, I do ask you to find uh, the charge to mass ratio for some things. Charge to mass ratio would be um, Q over M. So I'm out of room here, but you can do the algebra to solve this equation for Q over M. Yeah, I'm out of room. Okay, fine, but you could find out what Q over M is, right? It's not all that much rearrangement, right? Um, and I believe it should end up being, oh, I guess I do, have maybe, yeah, okay, it should end up being E over B squared R. No, I actually didn't have enough room to write that. Well, that's embarrassing. Okay, but you can do the algebra to go ahead and find Q over M. All right, I think that should be enough to get you through your homework. The homework's kind of designed to make you think a little bit, but this should give you enough of an introduction to it that you should be thinking about things the right way and hopefully learning a little bit about how these things work in the process. Thanks, guys. Have a great evening.